Well, I'm going to tell you something today that I think you all agree with. But maybe I can increase just a little bit your optimism about it. That the mutual influence of technology and society, and it's all about technological revolutions. And in relation to that, I have an important message for you. The possibility of a sustainable global golden age lies ahead of us, just this minute, just after the bubble collapses, just in this horrible time, which is similar to the 1930s in many ways, we can say that we are able now to rescue the good life that the welfare state promised in the advanced world and delivered, and is beginning to stop delivering, but might again, that we can make it reach the majorities in the world population, and save the planet for us and for future generations. And I can say all that by learning from the history of technological revolutions. So that's, that's what I'm going to try to tell you today. There have been five technological revolutions in 240 years. The first one was the Industrial Revolution, of course, in 1771. That's when the British developed the machines, the factories, and built canals all over the place using the experience and the learning that the Dutch taught them. Then we go to 1829, when we have the age of steam, coal, iron, and railways, Victorian times. In 1875 begins the age of steel and heavy engineering, electrical, chemical, civil, naval. That was the first globalization. That was the time when the steamship, the transcontinental railways, transoceanic telegraph allowed the possibility of having the South, Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, all those countries from the South bring, during winter, vegetables and meat to the North in two weeks because of steamships. So this created a new, very different situation which is as different as the one we're living today. And then with Ford, with Ford's Model T in 1908 in the US, now the revolutions moved to the other side of the Atlantic, we have the beginning of the age of the automobile, oil, petrochemicals, and mass production, which is the one that's still weighing upon us and making us live in this world of waste and super high energy because energy was so cheap. That was, plastics were so cheap. So that's what that revolution was about. And then our own age of information, technology, and telecommunications began with Intel's microprocessor in 1971. And that arrow, only half, is not a mistake. We've only seen half of it. We still have the best half, the best half ahead of us. If we look at history, that's how it has been. And then, in 20, 30 years, maybe the age of biotech, nanotech, bioelectronics, and new materials, we don't know. And I think I don't need to say any more about how bad predictions can be. But anyway, the one thing I can tell you is that there is no revolution that has not been around for at least 20, 30 years before really making the big difference. There were lots of electronic things before the microprocessor, but of course you get a cheap computer for, you know, with the whole thing, to be able to do the whole thing, and that's when you have the change. Then what happens? Each one of these leads to a techno-economic paradigm shift. That means that we change our thinking. We go from pyramids to networks. We go from thinking things to thinking information. And the whole change makes it drives a change of direction in innovation, in the economy, and society. It doesn't happen in one day, but all the elements with which the change will really happen are there, so that each paradigm brings a far-reaching transformation, a new way of producing, sorry, a new way of producing, a new way of working, because Companies organize in a different way, a new way of consuming, and a new way of living. 
But of course, these are major changes. So because of resistance to such major paradigm shifts, what we get is pendular swings in capitalism every two or three decades. First, when the revolution comes in, we have a period of financial capitalism. Guess what we've just had for the last 20 or 30 years? Finance forces the installation of each technological revolution because they make plenty of money. They have all these giant people becoming billionaires and zillionaires. That's the same thing that happened to Rockefeller and Ford and everybody else in the previous revolution. So what you have is this period of installation of the new with unfettered free markets and income polarization. Guess what? 1%. 99%. That's what happens each time. That happened in the 1920s, and it was horrible in the 1930s. But then it changed, because what comes after that is a period of production capitalism, aided by government. And that enables the full deployment of the new potential. Everything that was installed can now be deployed across the whole economy, not just the information technology, but the whole economy, including everything that we've been talking about today. And it's obvious, none of you will doubt that. But it also spreads its benefits across society. And now, how do we know when that happens? When there is a major bubble collapse that signals the swing, the need to swing the pendulum. So it's time for government and civil society to unleash the golden age which is to change, to tilt the playing field, to tilt the playing field in a very strong way so that things go in this other direction, not the casino finance, but actually the, uh, the good times, the golden age, good for everybody. Let's look at the historical record. Bubble prosperities, recession, and golden ages. We're going to we put all the revolutions in parallel, so we have the five revolutions there, the installation period, the deployment period, in between the bubble collapse and recession. So we have a bubble prosperity and a golden age prosperity. So all this thing, you know, they want business as usual, going back to bubble prosperity, that's no good. Golden age prosperity is what we want. So there is a turning point from finance to production. If civil society and government does it, we will see. So. In the first one, we had Canal Mania, then Canal Panic, and then the Great British Leap. The second one, we had Railway Mania, Railway Panic, and after that, the Victorian boom. In the third, we had all the big booms in the south, in the southern hemisphere. And then after that, we had the Belle Epoque in Europe and the Progressive Era in USA. <coughs> In the 1920s, the roaring 20s, with the automobile, housing, radio, aviation, electricity, all this huge financial boom. Then we had 13 horrible years, including a war, and after that, the post-war golden age. Now, we just had two, actually. One was the Nasdaq collapse. After that, a couple of years of doing something, and then another bubble, which collapsed finally. Can we perhaps have a head a global, sustainable, knowledge, society, golden age? I think we can. We are now there. We are now just at the point where the possibility of building a golden age is ahead. And the two prosperities are fundamentally different. They are different in nature and social consequences. Let's look at the differences, a stylized description of the two forms of growth. Bubble prosperity, golden age prosperity. I want you to think of installation as what just happened in the past 20, 30 years. And to think about deployment as the post-war golden age. There are some of us who lived through it. Many of you didn't, but I guess you know how nice it was. <laughs> or how nice it's <coughs> it seemed to be. I know you have another view, and you're right. This golden age is going to be different. But anyway, in between we have the recession post-bubble, and the shift from finance to production and to new lifestyles. Production structure is creative destruction, as Schumpeter called it. All the new destroying the old, so it's 
turbulent decline of some and rise of others. Deployment, creative construction, where we have new industries, new activities all coming together and creating synergies for each other. So life becomes normally a combination of all those new things. We all feel everything that has been presented today makes sense together. We, they, it's not isolated things. They, are all, they all go in the same direction. Investment in installation, concentrated in new technologies and finance, in deployment, widely spread across the real economy. Employment declines with modernization because productivity increases with the new technologies and also with geographical shifts, so it's a period of difficult unemployment. In deployment, we have reviving with the new fabric of the economy, depending on policy, of course. But then you can have employment in completely different activities, including the sharing economy, but then all sorts of things that that require new forms of life and new forms of employment, a lot of services and a lot of other things. Government, during the installation period, is impotent. It stays out or is pushed out, like it was this time. During deployment, it's active, it shapes markets, and it guides innovation. That is one of the most important roles for government in order to create a golden age. Finance and installation is the self-serving casino behavior. It's just for them. Whereas in, in deployment, finance provides profitable services to the new real economy. Innovation in installation, new products, services, processes, and infrastructure, but they're all new, and the old economy remains the same. Whereas in deployment, we have institutional and social innovations that help transform production across the whole economy. <clears throat> and finally, the direction of the shaping. During installation, it's technology that shapes society. It's the new thing, so you, you use the new things and you change your behavior. But in deployment, it's society that shapes technology. We already know what the technologies can do. Now we have to decide which ones we want the technology to do. And people can recognize when the time changes from one mode to the other. One of the signs is the spread of the new good life. With a new set of interrelated, sets, uh, interrelated life shaping goods and services at affordable prices, because things that you want become affordable. From the 1850s, we had Victorian living, when we had the rise of the urban upper and middle classes different from the rural aristocracy. From the 1900s, we had the Belle Epoque, the cosmopolitan lifestyles from middle classes and skilled workers. After World War II, the American way of life, which provided suburban lifestyles that reached all workers in the advanced countries and the middle classes in the developing countries. And from now on, will we have many sustainable lifestyles? All sustainable, but all different, depending on climate, depending on culture, depending on all sorts of things. We can have global diversity using information technology in a green direction, which is the only possible direction Climate change is not a problem. Climate change is the solution. We've got to use that in order to create this new life. So will it then go and, and lift all boats? Each style propagates through changes in values and aspirations, so we need to change values and aspirations, and we are changing them already. And they shape the consumption desires of the majority, guiding innovation trajectories and favoring a new pattern of growth. So actually, business starts finding that what you want is what they have to do in a green direction. And if government creates the conditions, well, all the more. Because this doesn't happen automatically. It will confront strong resistance from the old lifestyle. It must respond to social movements and aspirations. It needs to be synergistic, providing increasing new opportunities and advantages, and it has to be recognized as a positive sum gain, both socially desirable and economically profitable. If we can't achieve that, we cannot succeed. It will require bold and massive institutional and social innovation. That is what makes the difference. 
How was the post-war golden age unleashed? Well, first of all, we have the innovation enablers. Cheap oil, which made for the automobile and materials, all the plastics, universal electricity for all the appliances, road and airway networks. Government had a big role in creating all that infrastructure. Then we have the demand volume. What created the demand volume? Well, the welfare state, which guaranteed that people had the money to buy the things. The labor unions who fought to increase um, salaries with productivity. Public procurement, everything that government bought. And the credit system for people, because people were buying big items, houses, cars, and electrical appliances. And if they lost their job, they had to get, you know, they had credit and they had the welfare state to guarantee that they continued. So this is what made for the demand volume. Now, what of what? What's the direction for innovation? Well, suburbanization, so people would have houses, cars, electrical appliances, so you can innovate as much as you want. <coughs> then you had the post-war reconstruction in Europe and the Cold War, unfortunately, but that's one of the big innovation areas too. So we had all these things together. It required massive institutional innovation, the whole Keynesian way of the state intervening. And the same basic framework with a wide range of variation between countries was applied practically in all the advanced countries, plus the new Bretton Woods institutions at the international level. Well, with all that, it was a positive sum game between business and society that produced the greatest boom in history. Can the ICT paradigm do for the global population what the mass production paradigm did <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> for the great majorities of the first world? Well, there is an opportunity space now for a global positive sum game. How many? How many minutes? Five? What is this space? It's a combination of cheap universal, inter universal internet and information technology in general, full global development, and green growth. Green growth. Revamping transport, energy, products, and production systems to make them sustainable is equivalent to post-war reconstruction and suburbanization. That means a complete different way of life, which is about health, <coughs> which is based on services and not possession of goods, maybe just access to them. Full global development, incorporating, if we incorporate successive new millions into sustainable consumption patterns, <coughs> with environmentally friendly infrastructures, that would be equivalent to the welfare state and government procurement, in terms of demand creation. I'm sorry, I didn't have an ounce of voice two days ago. I thought today I was okay. But I, I hope I'll get to the end. <clears throat> so we need full global development, but it cannot be the American way of life. If we think that all the Chinese can have the American way of life, we're crazy. We only have one planet. And if we count the Chinese, the Africans, the Indians, the Latin Americans, it's impossible. So we've got to have green, but we need the whole world to develop with sustainable things so that we can have enough markets. Markets for services, markets for things that are not energy intensive, markets for alternative energies, the whole thing for everybody, because we cannot think that the developed world is going to sacrifice whatever and the others are not going to have a chance. So the other is that full internet access at low cost is equivalent to electrification and suburbanization in facilitating demand and multiplying education across the world. So we have a picture of what we could do, but it requires a lot. But of course, the new technologies and their paradigm only define the space of the possible. A golden age is one viable option for deployment, with green growth bringing worldwide social and environmental sustainability. A gilded age, you know what gilded is, just a bad thing with just a bit of gold on top, shines but it's not gold, is another equally viable option 
and that's financial markets and the military shaping the playing field for a very turbulent world indeed. Society will build the future globally, nationally, and locally, selecting a direction within that white space of the viable. It is the task of this generation to be bold, to choose well, and to act upon it. Now, maybe you think I'm utopian. Maybe you think what I'm saying is just a dream. I want to ask you whether people in the 1930s, when there were queues of hungry people in the streets of New York getting food, when workers, none of the workers could even dream of owning a house, they lived in hovels. It was really a terrible situation. If at that moment, and unemployment 25%. If at that moment somebody had said, had described the post-war golden age, that workers would have houses and all this thing. Do you think they would have believed them? You are crazy. That's impossible. Not only that, how about the independence of all the colonies? With wars, without wars, and all colonies would end up being independent. What? Look, Hitler was trying to get colonies. That's why he did the whole thing. Everybody had colonies. Who didn't have colonies? You wanted to have colonies. Well, they are all gone, practically. So, at these times, precisely at these times, like in the 1930s and now, when we're at the turning point, when a technological revolution is there for us to transform the world, it is at these times when we have to be bold, because it's much safer to be bold than timid. Thank you. <laughs>